My name is Peter Taylor. I'm the director of the Australian Research Centre of Excellence for Mathematical and Statistical Frontiers, ASEMS, which is the uh, centre that's sponsoring this uh, public lecture. Uh, before I start, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which, uh, at least the land I'm sitting in, which the University of Melbourne is located, the, the traditional owners of the land are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and they've been custodi custodians of the land for thousands of years. And I re pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging, and the Aboriginal elders of other communities who happen to be online today. So welcome to those people. And indeed, welcome everybody. Um, it's my absolute pleasure to invite you uh, to, to welcome you to this uh, online seminar. And we're very, very lucky to have as a speaker, um, David Boulding, who is a colleague of mine in the School of Maths and Stats at the University of Melbourne, as well as being in the School of Biosciences. And what he really is, is the Director of Melbourne Integrative Genomics. And David has a long experience in, um, in uh, working with statistics in courtrooms in various ways. And um, I've had the opportunity to talk to him about this on a few occasions before, and it's always been completely fascinating, and I'm sure it will be today. I'll ask David to commence. How to evaluate evidence in the criminal courtroom by Professor David Bullion. Uh, thanks, Peter, for the introduction, and thanks, everyone, for, for coming along. Yes. Uh, so my background is in maths and stats. I've been, since I finished my PhD, I've been mostly working in problems related to genetics. And as part of that, I got involved in DNA profile evidence. And I've spent a lot of time in uh, courtrooms and talking to lawyers about DNA profile evidence, uh, about the evaluation of the weight of evidence and the population genetics aspects. And I'll be talking through uh, a little bit of that uh, uh, with you today. Uh, most of my career was spent in the UK and I've been, I'll give you some experience from courts uh, in and around uh, London and, uh, uh, and also, yes, in, uh, in Scotland. Um, and uh, I want to start off with, though, but coming from a, a maths and stats background, I want to start off with some uh, questions for you. So uh, why don't you have a little think about this? Uh, you've got some evidence at the, sign of, at the scene of a crime. Uh, you've got a DNA profile matching um, the uh, population relative frequency of the profile is one in a million. So how convinced are you that, um, that you've got the right guy? Uh, so this is a big question that came up when DNA profiles were first developed a few decades ago now. Uh, and it turned out to be kind of um, difficult and controversial. And I'll talk you through some of the problems. But, but even now, I think generally people are not very good at thinking through these problems. So why don't you kind of challenge yourself a little bit? Uh, clearly, this is not going to have a precise answer because I haven't told you enough, but how would you go about answering the question? And how would you think about this next supplementary question? So this is more or less a quote from a very famous scientist uh, saying, well, who cares whether it's one in a million or, or one in 10 million or, or 10 in a million? Because, you know, obviously, you know, as scientists, we're used to thinking of P equals 0.05 as being a benchmark. So these numbers are all way smaller than that. Uh, so the evidence is overwhelming anyway. So uh, is that true? Uh, and if you think it's true, how would you explain it to someone else? Uh, now, uh, before I even begin to give you some hints, I'm gonna challenge you with more questions. Um, so what about a database search? Up until, so one of the things missing from that previous question was I didn't tell you how the defendant came to be a suspect. So now, now I do. Uh, the defendant was the only match uh, with the crime scene profile in a database of N named individuals. Um, so, uh, and that's how, you know, so basically there was no pr a prior reason to suspect this individual. He provided the match in the database. So he became the suspect and was uh, put in court and charged with the offense. So does this searching through the database make it more or less likely that we've got the right guy? Uh, I'd love to have time to discuss all this with you, uh, but uh, and we're not gonna really, but you can have a few seconds to kind of challenge yourself. What do you think? Is, that, is the evidence now stronger? Is it weaker? Uh, how does that vary as I make N big or small? Okay, you've thought about those questions for a minute. I'm gonna give you uh, oh, sorry, I forgot one. There are a few more issues to take into account. I forgot this slide. Yes, there are, obviously there's a whole lot of extra complications in real offences. Here's just a few of them. Um, uh, 
The one in the middle there about eyewitness evidence, that's from a court case almost exactly um, that I uh, had some involvement with, uh, where there was DNA evidence apparently implicating uh, a defendant, uh, but the victim more or less said he didn't do it. And, and he didn't, she didn't quite say that. She said he doesn't resemble a man. Uh, so how do you how do you deal with that? How do you factor in extra things like that into your previous answers? And you know, obviously, any human activity involves some errors. Uh, there's a whole talk I could give on errors. I won't say too much about that today. Um, but there's also partial profiles when the DNA profiling doesn't entirely work. There's mixed profiles when there's DNA from. So there's all these kind of issues uh, that we've got to be able to deal with and, 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 and we've got to be able to add to these questions we're asking complications such as these ones here. All right, the answer. Everybody ready? Uh, well, of course, uh, I'm not going to give you an answer. Uh, there's no precise answers to any of these questions, uh, but, uh, and, and, you know, it's important to, 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 to remember that, but we do have, that doesn't mean that, you know, kind of mathematics and quantifying the evidence isn't valuable. It's usually valuable, I hope to convince you. Um, we do have a way of thinking systematically about the problems and the, and we can do quantitative thought experiments and this can be hugely illuminating. Um, so, uh, but, but just if I backtrack a little bit, when the DNA profile evidence was, was originally introduced in courts, it was highly controversial. And it soon became clear that hardly any scientists could really understand weight of evidence and, and how to address any of these factors that I've been talking about. Uh, so now what I should say next is that statisticians came to the rescue and sorted out all the problems and explained how it should be done. Uh, but of course, that wasn't true either. At the time, the statisticians weren't much better at, at, at understanding evidential weight because there's some special factors here that made it different from standard scientific paradigms. Uh, and also, it's the fact that standard scientific paradigms are not very good, I think, is a kind of relevant uh, issue here. But if anything, statisticians made things worse because they were confident in the wrong answer in many cases. Um, and in particular, when this, there were quite a few, you know, efforts by the great and the good to try and formulate answers to these questions, uh, and there, were, there was much kind of controversy at the time. The National Research Council of the USA uh, was one of the most prominent ones. They, I, I fudged over a little bit. There are actually two reports a few years apart. The first one didn't have any statisticians involved. The second one did have statisticians involved, prominent statisticians. But unfortunately, the NRC was very keen on, on having a committee that was unbiased. And so they wanted people who hadn't thought about the problem before. And so people like me that understood the issues uh, were not uh, involved, only people who hadn't thought about the problem before. And that turned out to be problematic. They got it. They completely misunderstood the issues and got a lot wrong. There were some good things in the report, but on the whole, it was quite. Uh, it was quite poor. And yet, this is just about evaluating the support of evidence for or against hypotheses, a, a little bit different in the court setting, but essentially, it's the kind of bread and butter of science and, and also stati statistics. So I asked the rhetorical question, how could everyone be so bad at it? I don't have an answer to that question. Uh, they were, and but I don't want to sound too superior either, because it's, you know, I've had uh, decades of thinking about this and all of the, you know, my, my the understanding that I've come to didn't come in one go. It did take a while. They're complicated issues. Um, so let's get back to the, um, the, the this kind of uh, formalization that you can do uh, and the answers that you can come to. So, uh, and basically, it, it's, it's just elementary probability theory. You can think about this as being, um, you know, within the Bayesian paradigm of statistical inference. I don't even think that's all that relevant. It's just basically, uh, you know, what we want to know is this, what's the probability that the, the, the guy Q, who is accused to be the source of the DNA, uh, and given all the evidence, we want to know what's the probability that he is the source. Uh, whether that means he's guilty of the crime or not, of course, is another logical step that it's up to the court to decide. But this is what, a, what an expert witness, a, a DNA uh, expert witness could uh, give evidence about. Um, and the formula on the right is, is just a version of Bayes' theorem, it's, it's, or, or you can just think of it as kind of elementary probability theory. I won't go into it in any detail, but it's not too 
complicated and it sort of makes sense when you think about it. You might not get to that stage here, um, but um, we, we, it's the, the probability of the evidence when or, you know, and Q being the source divided by all the possibilities. So that's the one we're interested in. This is all the other. So this summation is over everyone else is over, including Q, but all the other individuals who could be the source of the, of the, of the profile. Um, it could be everyone on Earth. Uh, it doesn't really matter because the probability will vanish for people who were on the other side of the world at the time the crime was committed. It, or, you know, everything uh, I'm talking about today has caused a lot of problem and confusion in the past. And I remember one judge in particular who was particularly anxious about this question that it, you know, that you can't, you know, surely we can't take into account everyone on Earth. Uh, that would be impossible. Uh, and yet, it's just a simple matter of logic that if you want to prove that I committed the crime, you must logically prove that everyone else on earth didn't commit the crime. Uh, so th there's nothing particularly challenge about, about that. It's just uh, logic and applies um, in every case. Um, now, this kind of mathematical formalization, you could imagine some of the legal fraternity and judges are sympathetic, but on the whole, they're not. They're, of course, horrified at quantification coming in and, uh, and you know, we have statements from judges saying, oh, we don't make decisions based on mathematics or mathematical calculations. And all that's true. What I'm proposing is a kind of guide in, guidance to thinking, not an answer to the problem. And one of the, you know, we get some insights straight away. I've left it blank for the moment so you can think about, well, how, what do we get just by writing down this relatively simple probability formula? Well, um, one of the important insights that, uh, a lot of that, that you know really does matter a lot and really people get this wrong very often um, is that in order for the probability that you want to be high that you're interested in in order for that to be high it's not just that a particular alternative has to be improbable it's that the sum over all the alternatives has to be improbable and that's very important because people often compare the allegation that this man produced the dna with a random man, i.e. one alternative man. Uh, but you need to prove that cumulatively over all alternative men uh, or alternative sources of the DNA, um, uh, that they add up to something small, basically, in their, in their plausibility. The probability of the evidence under that scenario has to add up to something small in order to be sure that we've got the right guy. And again, potentially that's over everyone on Earth. Uh, but you can easily dismiss most of the people on Earth because they were, you know, been miles away at the time. Um, but another important thing is, is I, I haven't quite done the next step here to break this down into the conditional probability of the evidence given the source times the marginal probability. Uh, but but those with a bit of probability will will, will understand that. That's the basic definition of this conditional probability. Um, but it breaks down nicely into the role of the expert witness versus the role of the court. So the expert can evaluate the probability of the evidence, the DNA evidence, uh, you know, conditional on a hypothesis about who, who's, whose DNA it is. Um, but then for this marginal or prior probability for that person to be, that depends on judgments given the other evidence about how plausible this person is as a source of the DNA. And that will, um, and that's a matter for the court, not the expert. So again, that's a kind of extra indication that the expert can't do a mathematical calculation and give the answer. That will never be the case, uh, but these kind of calculations can be very helpful. Um, I won't go into this uh, too much detail, but I already mentioned this NRC. These are all, these were, you know, um, fellows of the uh, National Academy of Sciences in the US and, uh, and so very distinguished scientists. Uh, they come up with something along the lines of a standard um, scientific paradigm, setting out a null hypothesis and, uh, and the significance level. Uh, it just doesn't work here. I don't have any time to go in it in any detail. Um, I, I mean, what you might, I've got some problems there. there. There's a real problem about how you define the population. Uh, you don't get much clue about how to take into account these other factors. Uh, there is a sort of fundamental question of why would you consider null hypothesis that is clearly false? Uh, but unfortunately, that's less um, that's a less telling criticism than it sounds because, as any statistician will know, we very often uh, um, pose null hypotheses that are pretty clearly false. In fact, uh, 
It was given me as a guidance one early in my career that you can tell which hypothesis is the null hypothesis because it's the one that's obviously wrong. Uh, but, um, uh, but here it's a kind of particularly problematic. And, and particularly the idea, it's a very prevalent idea that you contrast the allegation against an individual with the alternative of a random, randomly selected person. And that's wrong for, and for a whole lot of reasons. Randomness doesn't play any role here and shouldn't. Uh, I mean, random sampling in the population isn't relevant and causes lots of problems that I, I don't have time to go into. So here's how we can think through. We, in a particular crime, we can't go through the whole calculation for reasons I've just given you, but we can do a thought experiment. Uh, and, and the thought experiment is uh, an island with a finite population, and the simplifying assumption is that all the, all the residents of the island are initially equally under suspicion. So in other words, that's a uniform prior for those that are familiar with that language. Um, so one of them is guilty, one of them is tested and found to match. Uh, we're in a perfect world where no errors ever occur. Um, so what, what can we conclude in that case? Well, that's enough really to pretty much come up with, a, with an answer. Um, a few, little bit more probability manipulations that I won't go into in any detail. Uh, now all the alternative individuals under our assumptions, they're all equivalent, so we can lump them together and multiply by the number of them, and we come up with a nice simple formula uh, that involves the number of alternative suspects and this conditional probability uh, that I'm going to call the match probability. Now, even though, um, you know, so this is, a, an, this is an answer that you can work out in any particular example. It's not going to be exactly relevant for any case, but it really, it's really illuminating, I think, uh, and, and, and essentially provides a way of thinking about the answers to all the problems that I've raised so far. Um, so one thing that people often got wrong was thinking about it's the relative frequency in the, of the profile in the population. And there's a lot of discussion about sampling errors and, and these kinds of issues. But it's not the relative frequency that matters. It's this conditional probability because you've already seen if, some, if, if the allegation is wrong and someone else is the source of the DNA, uh, then we've got two uh, individuals with that profile. Uh, and it's the conditional probability of the second given the first. Uh, but also um, population genetics issues, DNA frequencies vary from population to population. Uh, that was a big area of controversy in the early days. People didn't know how to deal with it, but this formalization tells you how to deal with it um, because this conditional probability, uh, I mean, basically relates closely to a well-established population genetics parameter, often called FST in, in forensics, it's usually referred to as theta. Um, and uh, so I won't go into that in detail, but that's where I kind of made my early claim in, in, my, in my career to uh, for these problems of working out some formulas for, um, for dealing with these population genetics effects. Um, but going back to the one of the second question I posed, does it matter if the match probability is 10 to the minus five or 10 to the minus seven rather than 10 to the minus six? And yes, it does hugely here on this island problem because the probability we've got the right guy varies from one in 11, so it's probably not him, up to 10 and 11, so it probably is him uh, un, un, in this sort of slightly artificial scenario. And that quote that it does, you know, who cares anyway because they're all small numbers, that came from a very famous scientist who's president of the National Academy of Sciences in the US uh, and doesn't understand basic weight of evidence um, and uh, it's, it's unfortunate. The National Academy of Sciences, by the way, in the US did come, has gone on to produce a subsequent report that was, that was very valuable. And lately, this same uh, man I'm criticizing for, for, about, for misunderstanding this issue uh, was kind of chair of a president's advisory panel that came up with a report on forensic evidence that was quite helpful in many ways. And they got a lot of things right about many of the problems with forensic uh, evidence. Um, a little bit of a detour here, I'd say briefly the problem is that the courts rely too much on expertise of the, of the person rather than facts and data backing up the evidence. Um, so they got a lot of right in that report, but even now they don't understand these questions of evidential weight very well. Um, and yet it's not that hard if you think about the problems in the right way. Uh, so again, this is just going back to the, some of the things that the NRC got wrong. They, these are all wrong and all misunderstanding. Some of the top scientists in the world 
uh, just basically didn't understand quite a few years ago now. So these particular issues don't matter. I think the forensic community has pretty much got on top of these issues. So it's just of historical interest, but it's kind of interesting to think that these pretty basic questions, some of the world's top scientists got completely messed up on. Um, now, the effect of a database search, I think statisticians will be familiar with this, uh, the idea that when you make multiple comparisons, there's multiple opportunities for error. Errors accumulate, you've got to adjust for that. Uh, people might have heard of the Bonferroni correction. Uh, and basically the idea is that if you do many tests, your, your probability of error goes up roughly linearly with the number of tests. So you've got to adjust for that. And this is a very natural way of thinking in the context of the beta database search, uh, but unfortunately it's completely wrong. And this has been one of the thorniest issues because statisticians and many scientists are so highly attuned to think about multiple testing and correcting uh, for multiple testing and Bonferroni corrections that very high, you know, every six or 12 months, someone will pop up and say, oh, you've got it wrong. You're not taking multiple testing into account is not relevant here. Let me try and explain a little why. Again, go back to our island. It's now got a database. Uh, so some of the individuals on the island are in the database. Uh, when the crime occurred, we found the crime scene profile. We searched in the database. We found one match. Everyone else didn't match. Um, now that everyone else not matching means those individuals are excluded uh, from suspicion. And so now our database formula has changed. The n minus, big N minus little n is basically everyone else who hasn't been excluded through the database search. And this probability is now bigger than it was before. The search strengthens the evidence, doesn't weaken it as in the multiple testing paradigm. I don't have time to go into sort of great detail, but one, I mean, one of the things to think about in, that's different in this situation is that we know one of the hypotheses is true, uh, that one of these individuals is the source of the DNA. So the more you search when you know one of the things you know when you know that what you're looking for exists the more you search uh, when you finally find something that fits the description the more confident you'll be that you've got the right thing um, that's a big issue and as i said many people do get this wrong and we have to sort of go over you know for 20 years i've been going over this argument because people are so highly attuned to thinking about uh, multiple testing but i but broadly speaking that's important because the Essentially, you can ignore the database search. The strengthening is, is pretty limited, and you can basically just ignore that. And so it's not unfair to defendants to just not report that there was a database search, which is kind of important for legal reasons that that, that not be mentioned. Um, so going on, we can just broaden out now to um, what if there's a, a mixed DNA profile? What if there are multiple sources of the DNA? Um, then the match probability doesn't apply anymore because there's not just a single match, it's a more complicated situation, but it's a special case of a, of a likelihood ratio. Uh, if you're a purist, you might say it's really a, a Bayes factor, not a likelihood ratio, it doesn't really matter, and it's always called a likelihood ratio in, in forensic settings. Uh, and so that's, this is broadly speaking what the likelihood ratio looks like, how likely is the evidence under the prosecution story, how likely is the evidence under the defense story, um, and in a particular case, I'm going to use CSP for crime scene profile. Uh, and so the prosecution story might be that these individuals are the sources of the mixed DNA profile. Uh, and the defense is basically the same story, except that the accused man is not there and, re and replaced by some other guy. Um, logically, this is a bit of an interesting issue as well. Logically, the defense position should always just be that the prosecution story is false. And logically, that must be true, but the kind of legal experts that I've spoken to are, you know, and not very happy with this and say, you know, historically we, we always think about as a competition, between, you know, a, a, a criminal case is a, is a competition between two accounts and if the defense put forward a story, then, then that's what you should be comparing with. But logically, in order to prove the prosecution case, you must prove that the collective weight of all uh, scenarios inconsistent with the prosecution case, their collective weight has to be negligible in order to prove the prosecution case. Um, and that sounds very challenging, but it's just a clear and logical necessity, always was, even before DNA evidence came along. Uh, now, how can you use this likelihood ratio in court? And that's highly problematic, and courts vary in their willingness uh, to accept any kind of quantification of the evidence. 
And here, you know, I've emphasized this point that, you know, no mathematical formula is ever going to give an answer to, you know, is he guilty? Uh, but it really is a, a, a really valuable guide to thinking. So in some cases, I've been allowed to report things like this, you know, if you if the crime occurred somewhere where there are a thousand men who could be considered as the source of the DNA, um, and if the likelihood ratio is a million, then if just as a thought experiment, we treat all those thousand as equally likely, then we have starting odds, if you like, of a thousand to one against, or, or probability of about one in a thousand, uh, and then the likelihood ratio changes that from one in a thousand up to 99.9%. Uh, and of course, some of those assumptions are not true in a particular case, but that's a really valuable guide to thinking. Um, there are issues like the relatives of Q can have different likelihood ratios. Uh, so then the story has to get a little bit more complicated, but basically you can deal with it in a similar way. Uh, and I'll just quickly go through a few court cases I was involved with all in the UK. Um, and uh, I won't have time to explain them in detail, I'm sorry. Um, but here was an interesting one where the, um, uh, this is quite a controversial case because for, for sort of other reasons that a, the man originally convicted and jailed for the offence was later found, uh, found to be um, uh, innocent. This was the victim's boyfriend was jailed for the offence and then later he was, uh, uh, they sort of said, okay, whoops, we got it wrong and let him out of jail and then accused another man of the offence. Um, and he did have a match with a very small and degraded DNA sample from the crime scene. But there was a problem was because it was so small and degraded, it didn't rule out his brother. In fact, he had three brothers, but one of them very nearly, it wasn't, this wasn't a perfect match because it was a complex profile with some components missing. Uh, but the brother nearly matched as well. Um, and the lawyers involved in this case were very impressed with this 150,000 is a large number. You know, in some cases, if we saw a likelihood ratio of 150,000 implicating someone, we might well succeed in prosecuting that individual. But here we're saying that it's not him. In fact, it's some other guy, his brother. Uh, and they were of the view that this was such a conundrum that we couldn't possibly proceed with the case because the evidence seemed to point to two men and it was impossible to convict one of them. Um, but the... I mean, the right way of thinking about this is that 200 million is much bigger than 150,000. It's more than a thousand times bigger. And so your posterior odds on the original suspect must be at least a thousand times, no matter what your starting odds are, the posterior has to be at least a thousand times higher on this guy uh, than this one. And that, you know, is plausibly enough to convince a jury that it's him uh, and not his brother. So we can do a hypothetical calculation here just along those lines. Let's say there are a million men. Uh, there's the likelihood ratios. There's the posterior probabilities. Um, and, you know, under this scenario, a jury might reason that that's enough to be convinced that it's him. But certainly the brother alternative is, is almost negligible, you know, and not, it doesn't undermine the case as the lawyers had originally thought. In fact, under this scenario, the other unrelated guys are more plausible sources of the DNA. And again, this is not a, a, a real, you know, an exact answer. There's assumptions here that can't be true, but you can kind of see that it basically clarifies the situation, you know, because if, even if you tweak these assumptions quite a bit, it won't change the fundamental insight. And, in, and basically that's what I told uh, the court in Luton, and eventually the guy was um, convicted of this offence um, with this evidence being very important. I, don't, I usually just go in and give my evidence and go out, so I don't know what other evidence there was, but the court heard this evidence and convicted the man. Um, another interesting case here, just to, I don't want to, this, this one's very complicated, and I don't want to go into all the details, but just sort of illustrate some of the complexity that the sort of thinking I'm telling you about with with probabilistic reasoning can, can help you deal with was this quite a famous case in Scotland called the World's End case, which is a great name for a case. And it was because two girls were last seen in the World's End pub in central Edinburgh. Uh, and um, they, they were, years later, they were tried. There was some DNA evidence. There were problems with the DNA evidence. And, and, and the judge basically um, frowned upon these, the problematic aspects of the complex DNA evidence and threw it out and said no case to answer, which was hugely controversial because it's a very high profile case, a lot of media attention. And actually this case led to the passing of the Double Jeopardy Act in Scotland, uh, which allowed uh, these men to be, or to, under special circumstances, to be tried a second time for the same offence. Uh, 
which is not um, not normally allowed in the in the British legal system, uh, but it is under certain circumstances. Um, and then by the time of the retrial, it wasn't so much that the um, you know the DNA evidence was pretty much the same, uh, but, but although the DNA profiling techniques had improved, but by then the statistical methods for dealing with this complex and degraded evidence had um, had improved quite a lot. Uh, and I helped the forensic scientists profile 14 complex uh, degraded crime scene DNA samples. And there were complexities that you get a little bit of a hint of from this slide, which is a bit too complicated for to go through in detail. But basically the K1 and K2 are the known individuals and they were the two victims. Um, and so there's a kind of preliminary question of what, you know, is there evidence from victim one? Is there evidence from, you know, is there DNA from these two individuals? And basically, it doesn't make too much difference, but it does change the answer a little bit. And basically, I found a positive likelihood ratio for including one of the victims and, and sorry, likelihood ratio bigger than one, but less than one for the other one. So I, I proceeded assuming the presence of the first and not the second. When I was giving evidence in trial, the defense lawyer was very good, was very on the ball and understood that that was a kind of arbitrary decision and challenged me on this. I, I, I managed to convince the court that you know, although it was a somewhat arbitrary distinction, it didn't matter very much because even if I, you know, the other alternatives, the answers would have been much the same. And then we had to go through likelihood ratios for the first accused without assuming the second accused, uh, the second accused without assuming the first accused, then both of them with assuming the other one present. Basically, I did try not to make those decisions, just presented all that information to the court. You can see there's very strong evidence against the second accused, uh, but not the first. Actually, sorry, by the time of the retrial, one of these men had died, and so only one of them was actually on trial, uh, but we still had to you know, consider all the possibilities for, for the DNA. Um, so I went through this, and there were 14 similar profiles, and you know, these kind of you know, working through logically with, with probability allowed me to you know, come up with answers that I could present to the court. Uh, eventually, the, the court convicted uh, the, the man Sinclair on the second trial. Uh, and another one, again, a little bit complicated, I won't be able to go to in detail. I was kind of interested because um, Phil David, a prominent statistician in the UK, was advising the defense on this one. And I, I think he, um, I, I, he was a bit disappointing. But I have to say, one of the, one of the kind of uh, interesting parts of this is sometimes, you know, you have really good debates with, the, with an expert advising the other side. And I particularly remember, of course, a case in Winchester Crown Court where Stefan Lauritsen from Oxford University was advising the defense and I was advising the prosecution and we had really complex uh, evidence and you know we spent hours in a little committee room in the in the Winchester court room courthouse uh, coming up with a you know agree stance on the evidence which was presented to the court in that case um, the um, the defendant was found uh, not guilty uh, in this case um, I, there's another case of this preliminary question. There are two men, DNM, who are accused of the crime and therefore whether their DNA is present for each of them separately is an interesting question. But there was a complicating factor for this very you know, complicated, complex and degraded sample about whether or not there was DNA present from the victim, G. Um, and, uh, the, um, and I decided in my preliminary analysis to not condition on the presence of DNA from G and came up with a likelihood ratio of 100 million. Um, the defense, um, as I said, being advised by another prominent statisticians, they wanted me to report 49 likelihood ratios for all the different possibilities of including some and not the other and so on. Um, but my answer was, you know, ultimately there can only be one. It has to be weighted over, over the plausibility of each of the scenarios. Now, we don't know these plausibilities or the priors, to use the Bayesian language, but, um, but we can think about the best and worst cases, you know, so we can think about the best case for the defense is to put all the weight on the proposition that, that, that is most favorable to them. The prosecution is free to, to put, specify whatever it believes. And it turns out that when you take that approach, um, then you do condition on the presence of DNA. Um, and, uh, and in that case, it turned out that the evidence uh, was much, uh, stronger uh, for the um, for the uh, actually I think I might have mistaken in, in in writing down these hypotheses here, but the final gist of the story was that the case was much stronger. Uh, this was all in pre-trial correspondence, so they didn't bring that up at trial because that uh, that criticism didn't help their case. Uh, 
I want to briefly mention another case that I famously, and some of you might have heard me talk about this before, and I just want to make the general point that this kind of probabilistic reasoning is really helpful for thinking through complex evidence. It's amazing how poor people are at it, how few people understand it, uh, particularly um, you know, courts are very resistant and say we don't want to try people by mathematics. And yet, you know, if they did stop and 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 think about it, and you know, they'd find it really helpful. And so, when I was asked to help with the analysis of uh, the evidence for the famous bones in the car park being from King Richard III, my kind of forensic experience was quite helpful. But again, it was another evidence, of, and another case of quite striking that there are a lot of scientists involved in this bringing together all kinds of evidence. They did isotope analysis and radiocarbon dating and uh, every kind of complicated bit of analysis you can think of, uh, they did. And they had a ton of evidence and none of the scientists, broadly speaking, had a clue how to put this evidence together or evaluate it. And of course, you, you know what my approach is gonna be, somewhat similar to the kind of forensic case, but it was this was a particularly interesting case of, of synthesizing different kinds of evidence using the likelihood ratio. Um, and so here was just one of the important pieces of evidence was the matrilineal uh, uh, inheritance uh, and the mitochondrial DNA, which is only passed from mother to child, um, is um, uh, if uh, this maternal lineage was true, then these individuals here, modern day individuals, should have mitochondrial DNA being the same or more or less the same as Richard III, you know, i.e. the same, but maybe with one or two mutations. Um, and if Richard III, if the skeleton is Richard III, then they should match the skeleton. Uh, and in fact, there was a perfect match over here. There was just one mismatch here. An interesting sub-question was, does this one mismatch over here add to or detract from the evidence? Uh, it turns out when you go through the analysis that it's just completely irrelevant. And, and this whole lineage here, all of that work, turned out to be a waste of time, although that wasn't obvious from the start. It was once you got the perfect match here, then that became, and you can actually do the probability calculations. That was something nobody else could intuit uh, before I came along and did a basic kind of cal probability calculation. Um, here, there's lots of issues. You've got to take into account mutation rates, population frequencies, in which population. Uh, there was a lot of fun stuff there, but eventually we came up with a, a number uh, and you know, really interesting uh, analyses of all of this evidence. Again, none of this is is kind of objective in a classical sense of of uh, of what scientists strive for. There's all kinds of assumptions underlying all of these numbers here that can't be strictly true. Uh, but and we I expected challenge on some of it, but in the end, people were sort of overwhelmed, I think, and we didn't really get much challenge at all on this number. That it was really convincing uh, overall. Uh, you can see that this mitochondrial DNA was quite important, uh, but on its own, it wouldn't have been enough. You know, you really needed all the other factors as well. Uh, and there's an interesting story about the why the paternal uh, DNA didn't not matching. But anyway, I'm not going to go into that in any detail here. So the DNA alone was, you know, there are a lot of media reports said DNA tests prove, and that's not true. They didn't. The DNA alone was far from convincing. Um, it and but. On the other hand, collectively, it was all very convincing. And even if the skeleton had come from a matrilineal relative of Richard III and therefore wasn't him, uh, that the, the likelihood ratio is still very strong. Um, I wanted to just briefly pass by this topic of the replica, so-called replication crisis in science. And it's not, I don't have time to go into the whole story and I don't have the whole solution. Uh, but I just think it's relevant that the stuff that I've been talking about here is kind of relevant to this issue. So one of the problems underlying the so-called replication crisis in science is a kind of overemphasis on significance, typically at 5% significance level. Um, there's a famous paper by John Ioannidis, Ioannidis that many of us have heard about that uh, why most published research findings are false, just the talk, the title says everything. And um, the there's a whole lot of reasons that I think I hope others have heard you discuss sort of underlying this, uh, the pressure to publish, um, the emphasis on publication metrics. And by the way, I, I don't really have a proof of this, but I've seen it argued uh, that the top journals are less reliable because they can be more selective. And so the problems of publication bias and so forth um, and, and 
and data trawling because the you know multiple testing is really an issue in other problems even if I've, I've argued it's not in the particular case I was talking about it is an issue it does lead to you know uh, false positives being published and the effect is more extreme in the high profile journals um, and this has got a lot of attention in the last year or so that um, uh, there's a commentary in nature I've mentioned there there was a quite a brave decision by what I guess is a fairly minor journal uh, that banned significance testing because of the problems associated with it. Uh, some of you were aware there have been quite a few reforms, you know, that was much debated. The American Statistical Association put out a statement. Uh, there have been some good initiatives with, um, you know, open science initiatives, pre, um, you know, registering of studies um, and so on. Uh, but I just want to highlight that the sort of things I've been talking about here do kind of pave a way that, that, that's better than traditional significance testing in many ways. So what we really want um, is rather than, um, well, let me go to this point here. Yes, we don't want the scientist to be the decision maker to decide whether the result is significant or not. We want the scientist to give the evidence and give it in a way that evidence can accumulate over different studies. And this kind of likelihood ratio approach now used in many uh, parts of forensic science because the, its success in DNA evidence has led to it being adopted for other kinds of forensic evidence, um, not universally, but widely. Um, and, and this, you know, does provide some of the things that we want in a way of, you know, because the likelihood ratio gives a weight of evidence, it doesn't give the answer. Uh, you can accumulate likelihood ratios from from uh, independent studies um, and and we should go further and report assess assessments of of um, of posterior of probabilities posterior probabilities that the hypothesis is true uh, but also some cost benefit analysis uh, in order to you know help guide people about making the decision whether we should accept that hypothesis now, I don't have time, as I said, to go any, any more detail, and that's just sort of raising this as a potential issue. I haven't really investigated this very much myself, but it does seem to me to be kind of promising approach. But just before we finish, I want to uh, talk about some recent work where, um, th where I found actually that this paradigm that I've been promoting of, you know, you can think about it as Bayesian analysis or basically just, you know, just basic probability theory analysis, um, it actually runs into problems here. And, uh, you know, I've been advocating this for a couple of decades, but in the last few years, I realized that for Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA profiles, there are special problems that make it difficult. So the Y is just passed from fathers to sons. It's, it's useful when you're interested in the male contributor, but there's a lot of uh, uh, female origin DNA. Um, why profiling over the years has got more and more informative, so there's more markers looked at it now. So the total mutation rate is very high, more than one per 10 generations. I'm a little, uh, every, a particular, any site in the genome has typically something like one mutation every 100 million generations. So one in 10 is, is, is huge. Um, and therefore, the profiles are highly discriminatory. But if you and I don't have a recent paternal line ancestor, then we're almost certain not to have the same Y uh, profile. Um, but even if we're tens of father-son steps apart, we can have a relatively a substantial match probability. And of course, if, if we're separated by several tens of father-son steps, we probably don't know that. Uh, and uh, so that creates some complications. I mean, you know, this, the match probability now depends very, very strongly on something that we typically don't know. Um, so if there's an unknown, the usual Bayesian approach is to integrate or average over the unknown, but it's, it's quite problematic here because the effect of the unknown is so strong uh, that the assumptions in the averaging are gonna be really, um, you know, the answer's gonna be really sensitive to them. So it's a problem and, and nobody's really ever, even though Y chromosome profiles have been presented in court for 20 years, um, nobody really has come up with a good way of evaluating the weight of evidence. Um, and I just mentioned briefly here, typically people just report a frequency in a database, but it's really not much help to a court or, you know, there may be some adjusted LR based or a up a 95% confidence limit or, um, but none of these are really very good answers for, 
for reasons that I hope are clear, but I, you know, I could go to in, in further details. And there's even more problems that because there's this high mutation rate means there's potentially a vast number of different profiles. Most of them are not observed in the, most of them don't even exist in the population. And then most of those that do exist in the population are not observed in the databases, which are typically of the order of thousands. Um, and so the databases are actually not very helpful. Um, and this has taken a long time, but also my kind of island problem analysis is not really very helpful either. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, I actually published in the JRSSA and, and read to the Royal Statistical Society approach that I was very pleased with at the time of doing a kind of coalescent theory analysis where here's your unknown source of DNA, here's your suspected contributor. I've been calling it Q in this talk, but I used S then for suspect. Um, and I was quite happy with that in the time, but now I think it's sort of barking up the wrong tree uh, for, um, and um, uh, you know, for, for some of the reasons I've only been, can briefly allude to here. And our new solution um, is actually moving away from an overt Bayesian normal probability theory analysis. And that's just to use simulation uh, to talk about how many men in the population are likely to match. Um, and, we, and then you could report an upper 95 or 99 percent limit. So here's just the results of some simulation. This is the most you know, highly discriminatory kind of modern type of profiling. And you can see that the probabilities here for there being so how many men are going to have the same profile as you? Most likely we're over here up to 10 men, but there could be, um, you know, up to 30, 40, 50 males um, matching, uh, but, you know, unlikely to be more than 50. And of course, it depends on your assumptions of your model. And so we tried some different models here and found it doesn't matter too much. Um, and uh, we can um, um, report this to the court, not as a probability, but just say, you know, we reckon there's at most 57 men in the population uh, having that same profile. They're all related to the, to the accused, um, but they could be distant relatives. Uh, and here's, this approach actually illustrates quite nicely my point that the databases are not very informative because under this assumption, the observation of zero copies of the profile in a thousand only changes that 57 to 55 because basically we know they're all rare. So observing zero in a thousand is pretty much what we expected a priori, uh, and therefore it doesn't change things much. Um, I'm sorry I've had to rush through some things here, but I hope you've got some of the flavor. Uh, I haven't really got to the, um, had time to fully explain this new approach to Y profile evidence, but I think the interesting thing is after a couple of decades of, of promoting this probability probabilistic modeling approach, we've actually now proposing something that's a little bit different uh, and, uh, but I think it is the kind of best solution we can think of for the, for the special situation of that problem. Um, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot I had one last slide and I won't go into any detail, but it's got a remarkable little thing I'll just say briefly, because I think my time is up, that um, if you have a single profile match, that's what we've been talking about, but you can also have a mixed profile and then you might see two alleles at every locus. Of course, the alleles don't look like this, I'm just uh, you know, indicating schematically. Uh, and then you might have an accused who matches at least one of the two. Here, there's only one because, you know, because they overlap, but they both have the same thing. Um, so how much weaker is the evidence here when it's a two-person mixture, two-male mixture, versus here when it's a single? Well, most people thought reasoning, there's a huge number of combinations of pairs that could make up this mixed profile, and therefore the evidence is correspondingly weaker but we've actually shown that um, with this new approach I've been talking about, that actually it's hardly any weaker at all because all those other potential pairs of profiles are actually extremely unlikely to exist in the population and, and cumulatively they don't make much effect. So I just thought I'd slip in that little interesting fact, which is in a paper I published last year um, with my, this Y chromosome work, by the way, is with my collaborator in Denmark, uh, Mikkel Andersen. Um, some of the other early work was in collaboration with Peter Donnelly. Uh, uh, I've uh, written a book with my former PhD student, which has got some of this stuff in it. Uh, and uh, that's the end of my talk. Uh, so thanks for your attention and I'll try and answer some questions. Thanks very much, David. Um
Normally I would ask for applause so you can take the order <laughs> emanating across the internet because it was uh, certainly very fascinating. There are six questions in the Q&A, David. Can you see them? I might let you take them in the order. Uh, you want oh, yes, uh, I can. Um, yeah. And uh, so, um, ah, so there are some likes. Okay, yes. So two questions have likes, so I'll go to them first. Um, aren't you invalidating beyond a reasonable doubt? So this is from Janneke, is it? That, uh, and uh, judicial standard, as soon as you introduce probabilities. Um, even a 10 to the minus seven match probability, it still means there's a one 11. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm, I didn't mean to imply that one on 11 um, would be enough to conclude that we've got the right person. And that's absolutely a decision for the court and the jury. So, you know, I would say to the jurors, you know, under these assumptions, then I reckon it's a 10 and 11 probability that we've got the right guy, but the assumptions are not um, are just made up. They're not exactly right. So this is just to guide your thinking. You have to, you know, make up your own mind how many, what's the population of possible sources of the DNA out there and do your own calculation. And then you, the court, usually a jury in our system, uh, has to make a decision as to what's enough. Um, of course, it's a bit, it's a great unanswered question of what probability of guilt is high enough to justify a conviction. I think the system, you know, rightly and very deliberately doesn't answer that question. It's up to jurors. Um, I've seen a survey of judges. Uh, they seem to be quite pessimistic because the judges were asked what, what fraction of guilty verdicts is the guy really guilty? And the judges thought it was actually rather low, like 75 or 80%. I hope it's actually higher than that, but, um, but maybe not. Um, any case, yes, you're right. You know, I'm absolutely not, you know, I'm proposing these uh, calculations as a guide to thinking and it's up to the court to make the decisions. Um, so, so can I just um, jump in there? Because this yep. is a I've been puzzling about for a long time. I mean, that's really saying we shouldn't put numbers because beyond reasonable doubt is not a numerical thing. Yes. But that doesn't mean, I would always argue that in the background, it is a numerical thing. It may not be useful to think about it when you're making the decision. I mean, you just... Yeah, me, ideally... Perspectively uh, um, analyse whether the decisions were right or wrong, then there is a probability of getting it right. Mm -hmm. it um, might, in different cases, it might be, but, you know... So I would like jurors to do a probability calculation and come up with their own number and yeah. decide what I think. But I think the system says jurors have to decide their threshold. Uh, yeah. So often courts do things like, you know, are you sure, uh, you know, is it, uh, is it in the situation where in everyday life, you know, you would be sure of the, of the this is the right answer, you know, that, that, so judges often see, use wording something like that. Mm. Uh, but behind that, I agree, it should be a number. I would like jurors to do a calculation uh, and produce a number, but it's up to them. And, uh, yeah. you know, I try to guide them in that direction. Um, and, uh, and, you know, my impression is, of course, another unfortunate thing about our system is that you can never interview the jurors uh, afterwards. So you don't know what they were thinking. Although in one case, a juror looked me up on the university w website, or I was at at the time, and emailed me afterwards and told me what they thought about my evidence, which was great. Uh, but of course, of course, it turned out that juror was a scientist and therefore, you know, probably not a typical journal, uh, not, not a typical juror. And I don't know whether that breaks any rules. So I didn't, uh, I won't name who that person was. I think you're not supposed to talk about your jury. Yeah. Um, but uh, it was interesting. But yeah, probably not a typical case. Okay. Um, I'll let you take on the other questions, David. Sure. So thank you. I'm referring to the N in the population. It seems to me the definition of the reference on the computer probabilities, is it? No. So that is an issue. And again, um, you know, we, I can't define. So the N is the number. Uh, and I brought that in in the context of an island problem and said, you know, this island is a bit unrealistic, but it, in some respects, but it, but it is realistic in many respects uh, and it helps your thinking. Um, and, uh, so, um, but it is an issue that, you know, that's why we have to put a ring around this island in order to think, you know, to simplify the problem enough to have an answer. Uh, and in reality, you know, so I've just been recently dealt with a case, um, a crime occurred a couple of hundred kilometers outside Perth in Western Australia. And so there's a, was a complicated profile. The likelihood ratio was high, but not on its own completely overwhelming. Uh, you know, if we only considered the local community, um, it would be completely overwhelming. But if we considered everyone in Perth is part of the pool of 
of possible sources of the DNA because they could have driven a couple of hundred kilometers to this crime scene. Um, then that then you suddenly got two million extra individuals or, or a million and something if you're thinking of adult males, if that's relevant for the crime. Um, but so that makes a big difference. And again, you know, I don't have an answer to that. And, and part of my evidence, I say to the court, you have to think about how many alternative suspects out there that are reasonably plausible. You know, I did make the point that N could be everybody on earth, um, but the wider you make it, um, then the more you're including people who are a priori implausible. Like, you know, it's not impossible that somebody went from Melbourne over to Perth and then drove 300 kilometers and committed this crime and then came back. Uh, but, but obviously, um, you know, I think a juror would say that's, you know, the collective probability on all residents of Melbourne is small for a crime being committed 300 kilometers outside Perth. Uh, and so, but again, it's up to the jurors to do that. And I don't have, um, um, uh, you know, and, and it is highly problematic, but it's useful. I mean, in one case, with a very, very complicated, degraded sample, I had a likelihood ratio of just 200. Um, and actually this was put to me by the defense of, you know, likelihood ratio of 200, that's nothing. We're used to hearing millions or billions. Um, but in that case, I was told there was other evidence limiting attention to 10 men who were part of a gang and they had access to a particular house, which was their kind of gang hangout. Um, and so we're only interested in these 10 men. The gun was found in the hidden away in this house. We want to know which of the 10 men handled the gun. And in that case, a likelihood ratio of 200 in favor of one of those 10 turns a prior of one on 10 into 20 to one odds that we've got the right one. And again, that's not completely overwhelming, but that might be enough in the context of other evidence to persuade a jury. Uh, so, you know, thinking about that population of possible suspects is really important and ultimately a job for the jury. Um, so obviously I'll, I'll keep going. Uh, we're just up to 1 uh, p.m. now, uh, uh, my time. And um, so obviously people might need to leave, but I'll maybe answer one or two more. So Adrian Barnett is next. I agree with the idea of using posterior probabilities to make decisions, but worry that the art of decision-making has been lost due to lack of use. Yes, uh, researchers in health are now totally dependent on the uh, 0 0.05 p-value threshold need a lot of retrying to fix this. Yes, I'm kind of hopeful that a lot of this attention paid recently to the replication issue and the overemphasis on p-values. I mean, this, that journal that banned significance testing, a very brave decision. Um, so I'm hoping there's a little bit of movement in the other direction, I think, you know, and the, um, but um, so I'm not completely um, pessimistic, but yes, that is, a, that is a problem. And any of you who've worked in statistics, or, you know, of, of, come across no doubt a vast amount of bad practice in terms of all of those sins of kind of data trawling and changing your hypothesis to fit your data and all of those kinds of things um and uh, yeah so i don't know whether overall we can be optimistic or not but there are some grounds for optimism um let's uh see uh next one is ian hunt so would you describe the role of stash in court to deliver useful deduction deductions? Well, I mean, not if you mean a deduction that gives the answer that, the, of, you know, so it's definitely not the statistician's role to usurp the job of the jury and uh, of the jurors or, or the finder of fact is the legal phrase because in some cases it's a judge, but typically it's a juror. Um, and it's definitely not, you know, I see my job as to guide the juror and suggest you know, calculations that might be helpful to their thinking. Um, but, um, and so these are deductions in the setting of the island problem, you know, a simple formalization, but they're not deductions in the setting of the real crime uh, because, you know, they rely on assumptions that are, uh, you know, not strictly true. Um, so I hope that uh, is, answers your question. Um, all of these questions only got one like each. I don't know how every, but it's a very democratic audience. Everyone is only liking one question. Uh, but um, all right, let me, um, so Lisa Wedevang, is it uh, Wedevang? Uh, so uh, oh, where, what do you think is the best way forward for providing YSTR stats to a court? And should we be moving forward with the LR Bayesian approach 
or staying with the number of matches in the database approach or something different? Um, so good question. And I, and it does, I had to sort of rush a little bit uh, towards the end there. And I did, I didn't um, emphasize an important point that I was really focusing on the situation with these modern Y profiles that are highly informative and highly discriminating. Uh, but in many cases, um, well, not only there are still some older profiling results still kicking around in the system, but also the results are sometimes only partial. Um, and then the, the, when it's not so discriminating, a population match probability kind of approach can be not too bad. Um, and it is a bit of, it's obviously an important issue that I haven't been able to, um, to address uh, is, um, is, you know, when that switchover occurs. But when we have these highly discriminating profiles so that only a pretty small number of male line relatives are expected to match a given uh, male accused, uh, then I think the way forward is just to focus on that, how many relatives match. Um, and typically it's a few tens and it, you can take the database information condition on the database um, information in a way I briefly alluded to, but it's also in some papers I published with um, Mikkel uh, Anderson from Alborg in Denmark. He and I published a few papers on this where we advocate telling the court, we think that there are 40 or 50 men in the population who match. Uh, they're all relatives of this accused man, but they could be distant relatives so that the relatedness is not. And we think that's good enough. So then the court the juror has to say, well, okay, there could be 40 guys out there with this profile. They could be relatives and therefore resemble this guy in many ways. So is there enough other evidence to be sure we've got the right guy? And that also makes it clear that Y profile evidence alone uh, can never on its own convict anybody. It's never gonna be enough. That, um, um, is, so a question from, uh, my, no, after I've said that now, there are a couple. Lisa's question got two likes now, so it jumped up to the top. And now Michael Walker, um, is the genome sample complete? Okay, so no, with the, um, I, I didn't, I avoided telling you about what technology is being used here. And it, it's not sequencing the whole genome. There's a lot of reasons for that. One is cost, um, but another is small and degraded samples uh, make, make, can make it very difficult um, to, to sequence. Um, so current DNA profiling, everything up until now has been pretty much focused on certain specific loci in the genome, some genome locations that are relatively highly variable so that alleles typically have a frequency of a few percent in the population. Um, and, but so it's not the whole genome sequencing. It's a relatively small amount. Nevertheless, the, you know, re for over the last decade, the, the, the kits that are being used are informative enough that a good DNA profile match is near enough to unique. Uh, but what most of the more complicated scenarios that I'm talking about are with degraded DNA samples where you only get a partial result uh, or mixed DNA samples where you've got overlapping DNA from different people. Now, I made the point at the end that that doesn't matter too much for Y chromosome profiles, but for standard DNA profiling, it does matter a lot. Um, so there are cases where it isn't um, unequivocal. And, but if you do have good quality crime scene DNA um, and it matches an individual, then the likelihood ratio is so huge, it's pretty much uh, unique. But um, a scientist, I think rightly, wouldn't say that. And typically in our system, they would typically you know, just put a number on it and say like a billion. And when in the UK, the, when I was working there, the practice was never to give a number bigger than a billion on the grounds that a likelihood ratio of a billion was bigger, was big enough to convince anybody. But in fact, if you'd given the real number, it, you know, it often nowadays with modern profiles, it's like 10 to the 12 or 10 to the 14 or something like that. So it is um, a huge number. Um, right. Um, does... There's still a few more questions. Does anybody want to like any of the existing uh, uh, questions? Oh, I see a comment from a friend here. Fascinating. Thank you, Tina. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, let's, I'll have a quick look. Uh, probably easiest if I just continue through in the order that they appear to me. So I think um, next is Ian Gordon. 
the journal Epidemiology banned p-values in 1990. Oh, I didn't know that, and maintained the ban for about a decade. So apparently they haven't uh, maintained it. I didn't know that. Um, so uh, I, should, uh, I should look into that. Thanks, Ian. Um, so let's see. We're well past one now, so feel free to leave if you're... Um, uh, yeah, as many people have, but there's still 90 people listening. So thank you. I'll, so I'll just keep going for as long as uh, there's a good number of people listening uh, and the questions keep coming. So the next one is from Nanuji Lamichan, is it? Um, because precedent plays such a great part in judicial decision making, is there a potential fear that precedents of using numbers, especially in cases, could set a dangerous threshold with regard to evidence? Um, yeah. Uh, that might be part of the fear on the part of many judges. Um, uh, and, um, but I, I think, you know, we would always try and say, you know, even with a particular likelihood ratio of, you know, a million or a billion or something like that, I think that, that, that I would want, and I think it usually is the case, that it's presented in a way that says, you know, that you need to take the other evidence into account and weigh this with the other evidence. Certainly, you know, I've made the point clearly the likelihood ratio of a million. Early on, we were used to, you know, historically blood groups had likelihood ratios like five or 10. Uh, and so when early DNA profiling came along with DNA with, with likelihood ratios like a million, people thought, wow, this is overwhelming. But it's not for the reasons that I gave. Uh, and so the jury has to think that through, you know, in a city of a million people, um, that might not be convincing on its own, but in a, a small town or a house that only had 10 men in it, a likelihood ratio of a million would be. So, I, you know, I hope we present this in a way that makes it clear that you've got to combine it with the other evidence and there isn't any automatic threshold that corresponds to guilt. Um, we do have some thresholds that were conventionally used in the UK, and this is a little bit, um, a little bit controversial about, uh, about summarising weight of evidence. So a likelihood ratio of a bigger bigger than 1 million was the threshold to be called extremely strong evidence. And between 100,000 and a million, it was very strong evidence. And then below 100,000, it was strong evidence. Uh, and whether people understand that correctly is, is um, you know, it has been the subject of some dis debate. I find it a bit, um, I find it helpful, but, um, but you know, that, but, but again, that's just thresholds for, for these categorization of the strength of evidence, not a threshold for the ultimate decision. Uh, I think that might be the end of the questions, otherwise just some thank yous. And so thank, thank you for the, um, and uh, did I miss any, can anybody? Uh, I don't I think, think there so. There was one from Francis Saparovic. Oh yeah, did I miss Frank? Yeah, yeah, okay, yes. Um, uh, yeah, I did miss that. So um, thank you for our end, because it got two votes and then it went to the top of the list. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, that's all the more reason to answer it. What about the likelihood that there is experimental? Yeah, well, I did mention that briefly. Uh, contamination, that's absolutely an issue. Um, and uh, and that, um, that's definitely something to be taken into account. You can build that into the likelihood ratio, but, but often uh, the, um, you know, some kinds of error of the kind that they're typically rare, or we hope they're rare, but they have a huge impact. So that putting them into the likelihood ratio would probably just blur things, mix things up too much and probably better to think of them separately. But the big, it's important to be clear that contamination generally isn't a big problem, in, you know, in just, just in terms of environmental. So these small and degraded samples are nearly always contaminated with environmental DNA. And that is typically not a problem because it, you know, it's very unlikely to match and we can allow for this in the analysis. I didn't give any details, but it can be done but there are some specific errors and they have happened. And one of them, I mean, typically the reference profiles from the suspect are typed in a completely different lab from the crime scene profile. So the possibility of cross contamination there is, is limited, but you can get cross contamination from different samples from the same crime scene. Uh, so somebody might've been in one part of the house, but not in the part of the house where the crime actually occurred. And yet somehow the, the, the samples could get cross contaminated or even worse, and it has happened, that samples get cross-contaminated from different crimes being analysed in the lab sequentially. So there was a famous case in the UK where that happened, um, where um, somebody in Cornwall uh, 
was matched to a crime that happened in Manchester. And the guy said he'd never been to Manchester in his life and didn't even know where it was. Uh, and there was a whole lot of, he was partly in, invalided and seemed disa partly disabled and, and seemingly unable to commit a violent crime. And, and there was no, you know, there was no evidence. So there, there, there was all this stuff that indicated it wasn't him. And yet the DNA evidence was so strong that, um, that everything else was dismissed for a long time. But eventually it raised enough questions that they went back and checked and they found that his DNA had been supplied to the police for a minor offence in Cornwall, but it had been analysed in the lab immediately adjacent to the analysis of the Manchester crime scene. And there was cross-contamination due to a, a, a reuse of a plastic tray that shouldn't have been done. Uh, so, so obviously that's a huge, there was a similar one in Melbourne, the JAMA case, um, again, a man accused of a crime when there was a huge amount of evidence uh, uh, that, that, that it wasn't him. Um, and he was actually convicted and jailed for this offence. It's probably not irrelevant that he was a Somali refugee. He had quite dark skin and there were people, the crime occurred in a nightclub and in, a, in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne where there are not many black skinned people. And a lot of people said, you know, there was, you know, we didn't see any black man in the club that night and we would have noticed, you know, so there's all kinds of stuff like this saying it wasn't him. Uh, and, but the DNA match was so overwhelming that he was convicted. Uh, and it was only later discovered um, that the, um, the the victim had been analysed in a in a lab at nearly the same time that this man had had a reference profile taken for another matter. Uh, so there are there's a big issue about uh, that kind of cross contamination, um, and we can put in some probabilities, but basically it's just you know you really have to um, be, be aware of that um, of that possibility. Now that there have been a couple of these high profile cases. People are much more careful about checking those kinds of things, um, and so I think the um, the opportunity is reduced. So okay. thank, thank yep. you very much. There are a few questions asking whether it's possible to make a copy of your presentation available. I'll just um, point out um, that this has been recorded, and we expect the um, recording, provided we can get it there, will be on the ASEN's website, so you can go and have a look. Um, David, yes. I really enjoyed your talk. It's been fantastic. It's clear from the fact that here we are, a quarter of an hour, and you've still got you know, people left, plus a lot of interesting questions that um, I'm not the only one who really enjoyed your presentation today. So thank you very much, and uh, we really appreciate your contribution. Thanks, uh, Peter and everyone. Bye-bye.